This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started today. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Creating a Humanist Blockchain Future. And in this podcast, we focus on different kind of systems that exist within the world and how to kind of understand them in order to create a better future. Um, and usually, you know, we focused on some like macro philosophical systems, we focused on some like software systems, uh, but today we're going to focus on what I call human systems. Um, and these are essentially things like mental models, communication patterns, ways to kind of prioritize work within a company or a community. Um, and these are ways to essentially if you imagine yourself going through the world over time, it's like, how can you be more effective, essentially? Um, another great person who talks about this is Charlie Munger, uh, the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway. And he says, he talks about building a latticework of mental models. So that's the what we're going to be talking about today is very much in line with that. We're kind of diving into all the different mental models that we can use in order to kind of be more effective in life. Um, and so we're going to do a kind of a hopefully a quick overview of 19 books um, as quickly as one could overview 19 books and in these buckets they kind of start at a macro level first so like thinking in a big level like how should you prioritize your team's work and then once you think about prioritizing and minimizing waste then there's the actual thing of like finding product market fit making value for the world um, and then once you start to start to do that then it's like okay how can you use behavioral psychology to actually like design the products um, so that's kind of that flow and then you kind of take a step back and zoom back to like how is the company operating we're going to talk about like designing effective organizational structures um, especially in blockchain lands and kind of these new the cutting edge of both blockchain but also just like new cutting edge organizations organizational design. And then we're going to think about some communication patterns that we can use to kind of clarify your thinking and work with others better. Um, and then finally, we're going to think about ourselves and how to use mental models um, for yourself. So that's what today is. Um, and with that, I pretty much think that we should dive in and start with the first bucket there, which is prioritization. Um, where we're, and we're going to look at the books Lean Startup, Running Lean, Scaling Lean, and Lean Analytics. Um, so these are all about how to optimize for uh, metrics, how to minimize waste, how to optimize for growth, those kinds of things. How should you, there's so much work to do, which stuff should you focus on, which learning should you focus on? Um, so starting with The Lean Startup, this is kind of the classic book that started the lean movement. And honestly, I feel like the book itself is not that actionable. I prefer something like Running Lean, but there are three specific sub frameworks from it that I, used off, that I use often. Um, the first is this build, measure, learn loop. Um, and thinking in this loop way is is something that people often do in this space where they say, hey, um, let's, they talk about iteration, they talk about doing something, um, you know, in this one, building something, um, you know, coding it, whatever, measuring it, getting some data back, uh, learning from that data to generate new ideas, and then building again based off of that. And this kind of loop iteration mindset is crucial to things like design thinking, but is also crucial to, um, to, this, to the lean startup mindset. So whenever you're kind of prioritizing work, you got to think about what you're learning and what you, exactly your loop looks like. And likely it's going to be something like a burn, a build, measure, learn loop. Um, and I love to ask the question, um, what is your vector of learning? Or like, what is your, and that vector has kind of two parts to it. One is, what is your rate of learning? What is your kind of learning oxygen? Your, your how much are you breathing in? Um, that kind of thing. And then also, what is your direction? So what are you learning about? Are you learning about like technical issues that you might be having? Are you at the beginning and you're learning about like, you know, what your customers might want? Um, so that's kind of, when you think about this loop, often think about what iteration cycles are you trying to do? What are you trying to learn? And, you know, think about that vector of learning. Where are you pointing your learning vector and how fast are you learning? The second big thing to come from Lean Startup is the three A's of data. And this is whenever you're, so whenever you're dealing with data, you know, in this new world of everything is data driven as it should be, because then you can kind of determine your correct outcomes and results from your actions. Um, you, that data needs to have um, kind of be, have a foundation beneath it that makes sure that a the data is actionable. So that's the first a that you can actually act on the data. Um, if you get data and you're like, oh, we, this doesn't actually help us in the future, then that doesn't help your build, measure, learn loop. Um, the second part of um, 
good data is that it needs to be accessible. So if data is only available for like the CEO, that's not very good. It should be like distributed throughout the organization. Anybody should be able to access the data to start to act on it. And then the third one is that the data needs to be auditable. So that means that you need to say, well, this seems like a weird number. Let's like kind of go back and see like, where did we derive this from? What does it look like in code? What was the actual thing that happened there? So once you have actionable, accessible, and auditable data, then you have good data foundations to go forward and actually act on that data. But don't act on your data before you are have um, before it's actionable, accessible, and auditable. And so the third concept from Lean Startup that I like is called the three engines of growth. And these are stickiness, virality, and price. And these are essentially things that you can do in order to grow the revenue of your business or to grow the value that you're creating for the world. So with stickiness, it's essentially retention, trying to retain users, keep them coming back. Um, and if a user is there for longer, that means that they are getting value out of your product um, and they're getting more and more from it and you'll get more money from them. So that's that's the first one, stickiness, or what can be thought of as retention. Uh, the second one is called virality, which is getting more people to use the product. So this is essentially if someone really loves your product, having them refer to a friend. Um, and that's why it's sometimes also called referral. Uh, so that's virality and trying to make your product one that people really love to share. And the third one is price. Um, and this is essentially using spending money to get more customers. Um, and so this is kind of, you know, called paid acquisition sometimes, um, where you essentially, instead of some products might be viral and that these are usually like kind of B2C products, but if you have like a B2B product, a business to business product, then that might be more paid um, where you actually pay to acquire customers. And when you pay to acquire them, you want to make sure that you're paying to acquire them um, at a less cost than they will give you over time. So this is what they call the customer acquisition cost is how much you pay to acquire them. And then the lifetime value is how much value you're actually going to get from them over time. And you want that to be a really healthy ratio, something like uh, three to one or one to three, where you want the their lifetime value um, to be three times more than you paid to acquire them. So those are the three engines of growth. And that's the final thing that I love from the Lean Startup. But I like the Lean Startup, but I love this book called Running Lean, which is, for me, kind of an actionable, condensed version of Lean Startup and really answers the question, how do we minimize waste? And within Running Lean, the crucial concept is to essentially document your assumptions, you know, up-prioritize the riskiest ones, test them, and repeat. So this is kind of another loop that we're talking about, another iteration, um, but it's really based around these kind of assumptions and defining them and then testing them. And when we test our assumptions, it's really helpful to be super aware of kind of two human biases that we have. The first is called uh, the solution bias, where when we have a solution bias, we essentially go out into the world and say, ooh, world, don't you love this awesome thing that I've built? And it's like, yeah, maybe, but the, the customers don't even know about that. They just think from their perspective, their problems, their reality. Um, and so, so that's kind of a bias that we need to push against is what's called a solution bias. Um, and the author of this book, Running Lean, uh, his name Ash Maria, he likes to say, love the problem, not your solution. Um, so I love that version of things to kind of counteract the solution bias. Um, another bias that we have is the validation bias. And that is the bias where we want our thing to succeed. We want our startup to succeed. We want our product to succeed. And so we go out to the world and say, hey, we ask questions that um, are biased to give us val to give us confirming data. So we say, how much do you have this problem that we're actually trying to solve instead of asking more kind of divergent questions? Um, and, and the validation bias also plays off of kind of social pressure where you kind of push the interviewee or whoever to kind of do say what you want them to say and they'll do it and they won't say no to you or whatever because of social pressure. So when everything about testing our assumptions there are lots of different ways to break down and kind of test our assumptions, but we really need to be super aware that we already have a solution bias, which says that we we want to, we think about our solution more than we think about their problems. And the other thing is that we have a validation bias where we want our awesome stuff to be true and to be validated instead of um, kind of being more divergent, more abstracted, and to have like an invalidation mindset. So... Um, once we start to actually, you know, with those two biases in mind, the two biases in mind, the first um, gate that, uh, that, that running lean, the book talks about is called problem solution fit. And when I say gate, I mean 
um, kind of going back to what we said earlier about what kind of learning, what is your direction of learning at any given point in time? This changes so drastically over the course of a company's life cycle and, and over the course of a human's life cycle as well. But if you think about something like Facebook, you know, Facebook in, you know, 2005, 2006 was learning totally different things and had totally different risks than they do today, you know. Um, they So when we think about gates, that's what we mean is you go through these different gates within a startup um, that define the things that you're trying to learn. And the first gate is called problem solution fit. With problem solution fit, you're essentially, what you're doing is you're using um, this thing in, called a lean canvas, which is essentially a really good way. Uh, it's, it's derived from, if you've heard of the business model canvas, it's a way, it's derived from the business model canvas, and the lean canvas is a way to document your assumptions in a clear way, and then to start to validate or invalidate them. And so with problem solution fit, you have a bunch of these lean canvases happening at once because you're still at the very beginning of your life cycle and you don't necessarily know what exactly you're solving or who your customer is uh, or even what market you're in. So you kind of have all these different lean canvases and with each of them, you're trying to invalidate or validate, you know, the problems or the customers in within each of those uh, canvases to try to get to one lean canvas. Um, so, you know, for a specific example here, let's say that you have this idea and one version of it, you're selling directly to customers. So that might be a B to C canvas um, where you're selling directly to people. Um, and then another canvas might be a one where you're selling to businesses. So that might be a B to B canvas. And you might with both those two canvases kind of test them over time and then eventually determine which route you should go to. And so the way to test that is really to do these what's called a divergent problem interviews at the beginning where you start very abstracted. You don't want to kind of, um, you want to be playing, pushing back against the validation bias, pushing back against the solution bias. Just really try to empathize with your customers, really understand them. Um, and as you start to do that, then you'll start to kind of converge on the problems that they have and like the, what you could build to solve it. Um, and so you can start to go from divergent problem interviews to convergent problem interviews as you start to find these patterns. Um, and then once you start to understand and kind of converge on specific problems, then you can start to prototype your solution. Um, and you prototype your solution by essentially you know, saying to your customer in like an interview or something like that, hey, here's this story or this promise about how your life would change after we after we change, after, after our product, um, after you have our product. So it's like, hey, before you had these awful problems, you had X and that, and it was so annoying, blah, blah, but then this new version of reality is gonna be so awesome. What do you think about that? Um, and the way to really judge whether they're excited is to get these early adopters are aligned with you, who see your vision, and who pay not for your product at the beginning, but rather pay for your promise, just your promise at the beginning. Um, and this is a crucial, crucial concept here, which is that everybody wants to get out there, wants to get their product, show it to the world, and then they're like, oh man, the world doesn't want my product. Well, and that's sad, but a way to counteract that is to really empathize with your customers, to understand them, and then to get your customers to pay to... <laughs> that they have intense enough problems that they're paying you to build for, for just the promise of building the product where you're like, oh my God, I, they say, oh my God, I'd love to have those problems solved. That'd be awesome. Do you have this yet? And you're like, no, we don't. Like, I'm going to start paying you now just to build this thing. Um, so that's kind of the KPI during the problem solution fit stage is the number of aligned early adopters who are paying for your promise. Um, and so that's what we mean by problem solution fit. You start divergent um, and then you get convergent with their problems. Once you understand their problems, you start to produce some kind of solutions that could work for them, maybe with some quick mock-up, maybe just with words and a story. And then you get these aligned early adopters to really start paying for your promise there. And you know um, that, you know, you know they're great early adopters if they're paying for your promise before you've even built it. Um, so that's kind of stage one, gate one is problem solution fit. And then after that, you go into gate two, which is product market fit, which is a more well-known term. And there are lots of definitions of product market fit. Um, but I really like how Ash Maria, the, the author here, approaches it. Um, he approaches it through kind of a meta framework that he uses in the book where you 
you de-risk your assumptions in two stages. First, you kind of validate or invalidate them qualitatively. So this is getting really textured interviews, really understanding them. Okay, great. You know, this is an assumption that we validated qualitatively. Then you verify that that validation, that qualitative validation with quantitative data. So this is with metrics, with cohort testing, etc. And so I kind of like to think of problem solution fit as the qualitative validation of your key hypotheses and risks, while product market fit is the quantitative verification of those hypotheses, where you go from just telling them a story or a small little mock-up to saying, okay, Here's what this product actually looks like. Okay, do you still love it? Do you still love the promise that we built? And you start to really expand and scale it from there. Um, so that is running lean. Great way to uh, to think about the early part of the um, company building process. So the author also makes, going to the third book here about prioritization, um, is this book called Scaling Lean, which is another book written by him. It kind of bookends Running Lean. One of the sides is at the beginning of Running Lean, kind of before you start doing your interviews, um, making sure that you have what's called founder market fit, where you as a founder really feel aligned with um, the market that you're going for. Um, and so we'll talk about that in a second. And then he also talks in Scaling Lean about um, after you have, um, after running lean. So once you're getting into product market fit, once you're getting into scale, how you should do that. So thinking about that first part there, that founder market fit, you know, before you do, you do your customer interviews, that's crucial. And, um, you really need to, and I know for me personally, I've had times in my life where I haven't had founder market fit where I thought I did, but it's really the first gate before anything, before prompt solution fit, before product market fit, you as a founder or as a person, you can also think of it as like person company fit. You want to be aligned with the business and the things that you're doing. Um, and so I like to think of this as kind of, um, I like to think of fit in, in kind of two ways, again, as a vector. And the first is the direction of that vector, which I think of as kind of, you know, the market or the customers, kind of where you would be operating essentially in the world. Um, are you working in with a B2B product, with a B2C product? Are you working with, um, you know, a, the, an art market or a music market? Are you working with maybe like, you know, a nonprofit market, whatever, um, that kind of is what direction are you kind of facing? What market and customers are you working with? And the other thing is, you know, are you aligned with kind of the, not the direction of the vector, but rather the line of the vector, um, which is kind of what I think of as like the ING. So like your day, your daily tasks, your daily actions, the verbs that you're doing. So for example, you might really be in an awesome place where you're like, oh my God, I love um, you know, for me, I love being in a world of systems. I love thinking about systems. Um, but maybe I don't love, uh, you know, podcasting. I actually do, but, but I, you can imagine a world in which I'm in a, a great space for me, but I'm not in a great, my day to day is one that I don't love. You can also imagine the vice versa where I'm podcasting. Let's say I love podcasting, but I'm podcasting about something that I don't like. I like, um, asteroids. Um, so that's, um, that's the first part of this journey is this founder market fit. And you can think about this for yourself in any given situation. Are you aligned and are you a good fit with that situation? The other thing that Ash talks about in this book is the kind of definitions of success. Um, so before you start something, kind of thinking in this 10x way where you kind of define, you know, three months out and like three years out, what are what would be what would you count as success? And then to really hold yourself accountable to that. Because I think a lot of people, they think of... Um, Either they think of the really big visions to, hey, we want to take over the world. Well, what does that look like in three years? How, have you really kind of, you know, pushed forward and, and, and made progress towards that, um, towards making the awesome thing that everybody in the world is going to use? Well, three years along, you know, you're not going to be there yet. So you need to know how you're doing and whether you feel like you've been successful. Um, so, you know, in thinking about those definitions of success, you really need to allow yourself to think from what's called a 10x mindset. This is a good mental model to have where you, um, for any of these given kind of gates that you go through, it's essentially, it's as hard to go from one customer to 10 customers as it is to go from 10 customers to 100 customers or from 100 to 1,000 or whatever. Um, 
So being allowing yourself to think in those gates in that exponential way uh, kind of allows you to kind of craft these definitions of success and say, hey, you know, in month three, if we have 10 customers, man, that'd be awesome. But by year three, maybe we'll have 10,000. And that still allows you then to by year, you know, 10 or year five or six or whatever to, to have millions. So thinking that 10x way is super, super crucial for uh, the definitions of success. And so that's kind of beginning, you know, before you do a startup, making sure you have those things. And then after you're, you achieve product market fit, after you're scaling, then, you know, Ash gives us this other way to think about growth, um, which he calls the customer factory. And the customer factory is relatively similar to those three engines of growth that we talked about earlier in the Lean Startup. And it's also similar to um, what's called pirate metrics um, or R, which is A-A-R-R-R, which stands for acquisition or sorry for yeah for acquisition um activation retention referral and revenue and that's kind of the stages of a customer life cycle where you say first you acquire the customer then you activate them give them a magical moment where they're like oh my god i love this thing then they're retained and then they you get actual revenue or referral from uh, the two r's at the end can kind of go vice versa you kind of get money from them you get revenue from them and then maybe they refer you to someone else so that's kind of the kind of life cycle of a customer where they go from unaware person to loving, paying customer who's actively referring all their friends. Um, and that's from the pirate metric perspective, which is done by Dave McClure. Um, and what Ash calls it is the customer factory, which is essentially where he defines traction um, or, you know, a key KPI here as um, <laughs> the, you know, the customer throughput, which he says, how quickly do you turn unaware people into happy paying referring customers? So that's what the customer factory is. It's essentially a way to think about um, taking people, uh, you think of it from the factory mindset where you're taking, you know, pieces of metal, AKA random people in the world and then turning them into awesome, happy customers. Okay, so now let's talk about the final kind of prioritization book here, which is called Lean Analytics. And Lean Analytics is pretty awesome because it kind of, it came out a little bit later than the other ones, so it can kind of take kind of a meta view on this prioritization uh, concept. And Lean Analytics as a book is kind of more focused on the quantitative analytics side, but they actually have these two things that I really love um, that aren't even analytics not necessarily so analytics focused, but they're just really good to think about when you're prioritizing work. And the first is what they call the one metric that matters or the OMTM. And the one metric that matter is like a single key performance indicator, a, a, a single KPI. And the reason to have an OMTM instead of a KPI or a set of KPIs because it really allows you to focus and allows you to think in that gated mindset, that what are we learning mindset, that 10x mindset to say, hey, you know, what is the key thing that we need to optimize for right now? You know, so if you're in problem solution fit, the OMTM is going to be those aligned early adopters that are paying for the promise, you know, and once you get 10 of them, well, that's awesome. And then you should probably change your OMTM to be something else. You know, once you're at 100,000 customers, you're not necessarily looking for those aligned early adopters. You're further along in the adoption curve than that. So that's what the one metric that matters does. And I, I love it as a way to kind of think about what you should be focusing on for your given stage of, um, of, of, of learning. And then the other thing that Lean Analytics does is it, they do this awesome, uh, as I said, because they came a little bit later, they do this great meta framework where they synthesize the past frameworks. Um, and essentially they look at, you know, these five different frameworks, the, the Lean Canvas, the pirate metrics that we talked about, Lean Startup. Um, and then they also take this other one, this growth pyramid by this guy, Sean Ellis, that we'll talk about later. I take all four of those, look at them, um, and look at the gates that they go through, and then kind of put a wrapper around all of them um, from to kind of map those stages. Um, and those stages, you know, they're, they're, they're similar throughout, which is at the beginning, what, what they were at Lean Analytics calls empathy. You know, you really need to understand your customers. And then once you do that, then you go into the stickiness stage where you really start to retain them, then into the virality stage where... Um, you really start to spread them because you wouldn't want to be viral before you were sticky. It wouldn't be, it'd be kind of dumb to get lots of people into your app and then they don't stay. So you really got to make sure you have that unique value proposition, that UVP with the stickiness, then with virality, you spread it. Then, you know, from a revenue perspective, really start making money from them and then go into this big scale mode. So they, they, they create that kind of meta stages or those meta gates by looking at these other gates um, 
from these different uh, frameworks that we talked about as well. So that's kind of a beautiful thing and a beautiful picture that you should check out in the article online. Um, so that concludes this first section on prioritization, where you're actively trying to prioritize um, the key risks in a startup, and you're saying, man, what are the top risks? How can we document them? What is our vector of learning? Okay, generally start with empathy. As you go through empathy, you know, start to test your, your solution in this really cheap, cheap way. Um, and then from there, keep on expanding and, and get into this 10x mode where you then expand to greater and greater lengths. So that's what prioritization is all about. What should you be learning at any given point in time? And what are your riskiest assumptions? So now let's talk about more specifically about that loop between kind of the the you know, the problem and the solution, or specifically what a lot of people call like, you know, the product and the market. So product market fit. And we're going to look at two books here, Lean Product Playbook and Lean Customer Development. Um, and so, you know, this is going not about macro prioritization, but rather, you know, think about the iteration loop of, you know, understanding and solving your customers' problems and needs and kind of delighting them with your product as well. So let's start with Lean Product Playbook. So Lean Product Playbook, a.k.a. LPP, um, incorporates this awesome framework um, called the Jobs to be Done framework. And this is a framework by Clayton Christensen, who's more well-known for the innovator's dilemma. Um, but the Job to be Done framework is really kind of a better way to understand customer segments. Um, and, you know, usually we think about customer segments and customers through like who questions like oh who is this person well who is our customer well she's a 27 year old female who makes 500 you know dollars a week <laughs> you know fifty thousand dollars a year or whatever um and so those are kind of the who questions that you usually ask but those don't actually indicate behavior like why is she buying your product why is she doing things um and so the job to be done framework really asks these why questions and saying, hey, you know, this, you know, this customer, this female, instead of understanding who you are, let's understand why you purchased the bookshelf. Um, and really that question of why you're pur purchasing the bookshelf, you can kind of, you know, reframe that as what job is the bookshelf doing for her? Um, you know, and, and the answer would be to hold books, <laughs> you know. Um, and so that kind of job to be done framework is a crucial, crucial way to think about the goals of your customers and and kind of your customer segments to kind of take away from demographic correlators, which is correlate with um, whether a person will want to buy your thing with actually like what job is this doing for them? What job is this solving for them? Um, and it's, uh, yeah, I, I think one, one quick example of it is, um, you know, they did this experiment with milkshakes and uh, they were initially thinking, oh, let's make the milkshakes, you know, saltier or sweeter or thicker or whatever. But then when they actually asked all these people, you know, why they were using the milkshake they found and why they were why they were buying the milkshake, what job it was doing for them, they found that it was actually that 50 percent of the people um, were having the milkshake at like 8 a.m. and they were actually using it in their drive to work as something that could sit in their stomach um, on their drive to work that was easy to drive with. So instead of thinking about it competing with other milkshakes, it was actually competing with a bagel, but the bagel was hard to like wipe on the cream cheese or maybe it was competing with a banana, but the banana, it doesn't really sit in your stomach as much. So this, these are all things that are informed by this great job to be done framework and Lean Product Playbook does a great job of explaining that. Um, so another crucial framework that Lean Product Playbook uh, talks about is what's called the Importance Satisfaction Framework. And um, this is essentially a way, so you essentially ask your, your customer, hey, how important is this need or job to be done? You know, how important is it for you to, to get that milkshake or to get that bookshelf? And they say, well, it's a, you know, an 8 out of 10 to, to kind of hold books to, or to drink milkshakes in my life. And you say, well, how satisfied are you with um, with your existing alternatives? You know, how satisfied are you with your milkshake or your your books or whatever, or with your bookshelf? And they say, oh, I'm a six out of 10 or whatever. And so once you get those two, um, those two numbers, you can essentially create a two by two that says, or, or a graph that says, hey, if there's a job that's super important where it's like, you know, I really need to eat, you know, that's a super, super important need that you need to have. And if it's not being satisfied, if you're like, I don't like any of my food or I can't buy food or whatever, then that means that there's a ton of opportunity there. So high importance and low satisfaction means there's a lot of opportunity. Um, but if something's not very important, 
then there's probably not a lot of opportunity there. Even if, you know, even if there's, they're not satisfied with something, if you're like, oh, well, how important is it for you to like jump rope? It's like, well, it's not that important for me to jump rope or whatever, to like jump over things. Then there's probably not going to be that much of a market there or whatever. So this kind of job to be, or this kind of important satisfaction two by two is a really good way to kind of dive into uh, your customer's uh their needs and how satisfied they are with their existing alternatives and that 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 thought about existing is a really crucial thing here as well and i really love to use the words existing and already here where you really want to check and say hey if this is an important need or job to be done that they have they almost certainly should already be doing existing things to try to solve it um and they might tell you, and this is a great other way to kind of distinguish between things that they might tell you because of the social situation, because of validation bias and whatever, where you kind of say, oh, how important is this thing? And they're like, oh, it's a nine out of 10. Oh, and then you say, well, how satisfied are you with your you know, existing alternatives that you already use? And they say, oh, I'm not satisfied at all. I'm like a two. And you say, oh, well, then tell me, what have you already tried? To you know, what, what are these other different things that you've done if they can't tell you, oh, I've tried this, oh, I've tried that, oh, I've tried this other thing, well, then they're pretty much, their words were essentially lying to you that it's probably not that important or that they're not that unsatisfied. So it's a really great way to essentially, um, with the important satisfaction framework, you can use that with the concept of past actions and the words already and existing to really make sure that they're they're telling you the truth and that they're already actively within this kind of space product and problem space that you're operating within. So that's the important satisfaction framework. There's this bonus uh, framework that's kind of built on top of it called the Kano model. And this one is not that important, but it is a helpful way to think about features and to think about kind of um, how far to go with something. And you kind of can break um, something down into three separate parts here or, or three different versions of features. And, and they, they fall on the kind of important satisfaction framework here. So you can imagine... Um, that there's a uh, one kind of feature called a delighter. And a delighter is one where they don't think that they want it at the beginning. And if you don't have it in your app, they're not they're not unsatisfied. So they're like, oh, they don't think about it. They're like, oh, this thing's not in here. Who really cares? Um, but then the moment you put it in, they're like, oh, my God, I'm so, this is so awesome. I'm so satisfied. So it's this thing. You can kind of imagine it as a graph that starts really low, really low, and then goes really high. Once you actually implement the thing, they become delighted by it. So... Um, that's one version of it. There's another version which is called like a, a must-have feature, kind of something that's like baseline expectations. So this would be like, imagine with a phone, if, if you're making a new kind of phone and it, and it didn't have the ability to call people. Well, it, it needs to call people, you know? If you don't have that thing implemented, people are going to be really angry um, and they're not going to be satisfied at all. But if you as you implement it more and more, it's not like people just start getting happier and happier and happier and happier. It's just, it's a must have feature. It's not something that they're like, oh my God, I love my iPhone because it's so good at making phone calls. Um, they get excited, but if you don't have the ability to make phone calls, then they're gonna buy something else. So that's kind of a um, an expected baseline must have feature. And then one in between those is kind of what it's called just a linear uh, satisfier, kind of a performance feature where it, it has a linear progression over time where if it's not implemented or they don't have it, then they're kind of angry. And then as it goes over, they get more and more excited by it. But it's not these kind of extreme jumps that happen with the other two. So the final thing that uh, Lean Product Playbook does is they do a really great job of breaking down the differences between the market um, or what they call like the problem space or the what, you know, like what uh, what is out there, what, what are the problems versus, you know, your product, what they call the solution space or the how, how are you solving them? And I really love this phrase, a textured problem space. And this is a really good way to think about how much empathy you have with the customer. As we, you know, we kind of talked about before, um, and, you know, you can say, well, how textured is our understanding of the customer's problem space? That's kind of a great way to think, well, we know this about them. We know that about them, blah, blah, blah. It is, it's a good way to kind of understand how much empathy you have with them is knowing how much texture you have on their quote unquote problem space. Um, so with that, that's Lean Product Playbook. The other great way to get to product market fit is through this book called Lean Customer Development. And this does um, kind of a deep dive more 
uh, you know, more on this, these practices for doing these these interviews with customers, which are generally, you know, they're called problem interviews, you know, empathy interviews, you know, that kind of customer development interviews, customer discovery interviews, um, and and these interviews. You know, doing them, there's the, it's a whole field in and of itself, and there's a whole book on it uh, called Lean Customer Development. And um, Lean Customer Development, it, you know, there are two key many takeaways I have from it. One is this great customer development question that I, that I love to ask, which is, hey, forget about what's possible. If you could wave a magic wand and solve anything, what would you? what would it do? What would you do? Um, and this is what I call the magic wand question, where you essentially – you know, the customer, and it's a way to break out of the kind of social norms, kind of validation mindset, um, the validation bias. And so it allows your customers to say, hey, imagine that magic was real. It doesn't, be crazy if you want to, be loco, you know, it does, who cares? You know, what would you want? What would you love to exist? Um, and so to kind of allow your customer and allow your interviewee to, to talk about that is, is really, really powerful. What makes it magical for them? Um, and the other awesome one is, you know, this question, you know, how many interviews should I do? That's a, that's a great question. Is it one? Is it 10? Is it 100? And really, I like to think about this as, you know, from, from a gate perspective, you can think of it as like the problem solution gate perspective where you say, hey, I need to get to um, a bunch of aligned paying early adopters, you know, who are paying for this promise. That's a good way to think about it. But another good way to think about it is until you're no longer surprised by the interview and until you can kind of like guess their answers. So this is kind of a great feeling in customer development in these interviews where, you know, you've done, you know, your fifth interview, your 10th interview, your nth interview, and you, as it's happening back and forth and as you're hearing the answers, you're just like, whoa, I don't really need to do that interview because it aligns so much with the things that I already know. There's no real new information here. It's almost like you could even do the interview for them. Um, Another version of this, if you want to push even further, is to kind of go into what's called an invalidation mindset, um, where we're mostly in this kind of this validation bias. We're like, ooh, wouldn't you love this awesome thing that we're trying to build? Um, but the invalidation mindset says, no, no, no. Um, you actually, you, let's say you've been hearing something in the ecosystem. So let's say you've been hearing from the milkshake people that they really want more sweetness in their um, in their milkshakes or yeah, more sweetness. And so you've been hearing that from everybody else. Then let's say you heard that from your first 10 customer interviews and your 11th interview what you do is you push back on that and you say, so, hey, 11th interviewee, what we've been hearing is that, you know, no one wants a sweeter milkshake. We actually want a less sweet milkshake. You know, that's what everybody's been saying. Do you agree with that? And so by saying that opposite truth, you're really testing that with the customer. And what you want them to say is that you want them to get angry and say, who did you interview? Those people were crazy. <laughs> you know, like, they, why did they say that? What they, everybody wants a sweet thing. Um, they're essentially pushing through that kind of social boundary in order to tell you that. So um, that was my other little mini takeaway from lean customer development that I love. Um, the final note here is this isn't directly attached to any book within the product market fit space, but is a crucial concept here, which is measuring love customers. Um, and as you're iterating towards product market fit, um, a great sign of product is as you get these kind of love customers, these customers that love your product. Um, and the classic saying here is like, it's better to have 100 customers who love you than 1,000 or 10,000 customers who just like you. Um, you really want that love. You really want that passion. Um, and so you can measure that love with a, custom, a, custom, a couple different ways. One of them is like the classic net promoter score um, where you ask how likely is it 1 to 10 that you would recommend this brand to a friend or a colleague. Um, but there's some other ones here. One is this Sean Ellis, uh, who we referenced earlier, who has the this growth pyramid. And his question is, um, you know, you ask your customers, how disappointed would you be if um, we discontinued the product? Um, you know, not disappointed, kind of disappointed, pretty disappointed, or like very disappointed. Um, and if they say, if you have 40% of your customers saying very disappointed, that's a great way to think to to know that you have you know a lot of love customers and are getting really close to product market fit. Um, another good way to think about this from Sam Altman is the question um, to ask yourself, do any of our customers love our product so much that they spontaneously tell other people to use it? Um, yeah, so he's saying, hey, you know you're to a good point where you should really focus on growth once you have at least one customer 
that really loves the product and is actively trying to tell all their friends about it. Um, Kathy Sierra um, defines it as like a badass customer. Um, so it's like once you kind of make your customer feel badass, that's how you know to really, really focus on growth. So all of these are kind of a variant on the retention and referral stages from the pirate metrics from R where you say, hey, you know, do our users stay around because they love the product, because they're really retained by it, they're, oh man, they love it, and then do they love it so, so much that they're actively referring all these other users to use it, and they'd be very, very disappointed if you took it away. So that's kind of a way to think about cust love customers and a couple different ways to measure them. Okay, with that, let's say you're starting to get into the stage where you're really starting to iterate on your product. Um, you're working through your prototypes. You've moved from the you know word-based prototypes, you know, telling stories to you know writing things down on paper to actually coding things up, um, whatever that looks like. Now you're getting into you know essentially diving deep. The way to, to kind of win here in kind of a weird way is through behavioral psychology. Um, and so we're going to look at two sides of this. Um, one is this book called Influence. Um, where you're trying to get your customers to say yes, essentially, to get your customers to buy. Um, and then the next book is called Hooked, which is a way to essentially keep them around, um, to retain them, and to kind of keep them habitualized. So let's talk about influence here. And, and when I talk about both of these things, it's kind of weird because um, – these are usually behavioral psychology is, is kind of intense and, and has some bad vibes to it. Um, so – I'm going to talk about these, but please use them in a good way, um, and don't just like addict everybody to your. Pro don't just force a bunch of people to use your product, uh, and then addict them to it. And and if you think it's a bad thing, so with that, let's talk about influence. Um, and so influence is. You know, it, it breaks down a book on how to kind of get customers, um, and you know to say yes to things and that can be saying yes to downloading that can be saying yes to buying it can be saying yes to any kind of part of that journey there and it can be really used for you know any like a digital product but also uh you know physical products um or like you know interactions with others in life uh, and actually the book itself is written from a salesperson perspective which is pretty funny um and so this is really thinking about the beginning of the r cycle there the acquisition how do you acquire um people to download your app um, so I kind of break this up into there are three there are six different um, kind of uh, frameworks around influence. Um, I like to break it into the people-based influence, time-based influence, and then kind of object-based. Um, and what I mean by that is so let's dive into people-based influence first. And the first one here is called social proof. And social proof is you know you essentially the idea here is like hey if lots of people are doing this thing then also I should do it too. Um, and so whenever you're on the internet or whatever and you, and you see something like, wow, 10,000 people subscribe to this newsletter or 10,000 people love this page, that's what social proof is doing. It's trying to get you to do that thing too because all these other people did it. Um, and so you can also, by the way, you can kind of make each of those social proofs stronger by making it them closer to you by making it uh, more, if they say something like, hey, a bunch of your friends have used this, and that's more intense social proof. It's not just like 100 randos um, are using this thing. It's like all of your closest friends are doing this. You must do it too. Um, so that is social proof, and that is a good thing that you can use to get people to say yes. Um, the second one here is called authority. And so social proof is for like uh, an amount of people in, like a large amount of people. Um, and authority is really for kind of smaller groups of people, like for, you know, one to 10 or whatever, um, for small numbers of trusted people. Um, and these things are really all around trust. Um, and so whenever you see a word like expert, you know, like these experts said to buy this thing or said that this thing was awesome, that's how you know authority is being used. So, you know, for like Amazon pages or for Amazon reviews where it says, you know, random, awesome, really smart person says that this book was great, that's authority being used. Um, so if social proof is for, you know, lots of people, authority, uh, lots of people to make you trust something to buy it, then authority is for a small amount of people, small amount of experts to, that are trusted to make you do something final kind of people-based version of things is um, is what's called liking. Um, and so social proof and authority are about kind of persuading people um, by using other people, by saying, hey, 
this other expert over here did it, so you should do it too. Or all these other friends or all these other people are doing it, so you should do it too. And liking is more of kind of like the win friends and influence people mindset. And it's just persuading people through just yourself. So it's like, hey, if the person likes you, then they're more likely to do what you want. So this is like if you put smiles on the screen or if you are a fun person and use exclamation points or emojis or whatever, um, then they're more likely to do it. So those are three kind of people-based ways to influence actions. Um, The next two are kind of what I call time-based influence. And the first one here is called is commitment. And it's usually paired with the word consistency. And it's the idea that if you get someone to 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 be like x to, to or to, to to commit to x in the past then they're more likely to do something like x in the future um so you can kind of think of this as like the foot in the door technique where you ask someone like a small little ask where you say hey just put in your email or, or just just scroll down or whatever um and once you add, do that small ask then you prepare for the bigger ass, like now buy everything. Um, and people, because they, they want to feel consistent internally um, with themselves. So if, you, if, they, if they agree to the small ask and they kind of think of themselves as a, as, as a person who signs up for this website, then later when you ask them to, to buy stuff on that website, they kind of see themselves um, as part of that, and if they go, and if they don't buy the thing, then they'll be, then they'll feel internally inconsistent. So it's just more consistent for them to like do something in the past and then continue doing that thing in the future. Um, so that's what con- commitment and consistency is. And just whenever anybody a- does a small ask, that's what they're doing here. So they're asking for a small bit of commitment um, in order to inform some future action. Uh, the other one here is reciprocation. Um, and the idea here is that you give someone something beforehand and then later um, you ask for something and then they're more likely to do it because they feel obligated to reciprocate, essentially. Um, so whenever this happens, whenever someone says, take this free thing, um, that's probably a setup to later say, well, now give us stuff or buy our thing or like do something for us in return. Um, the great example of this was, I believe, it's called the Hare Krishnas where they give you flowers um, and then after giving you flowers, their rates of like donation went up a ton because you feel obligated to reciprocate and give back. Um, so those are what I call time-based, where you do something in the past in order to inform a future action uh, in the future. Okay, and then the final one is what I call object-based influence. Um, it's just one of them. It's called scarcity. And the idea here is that if there's less of something, um, then it's more valuable. Um, So the first tactics are kind of like more about the interaction between the customer and the buyer. Um, And scarcity is just about the thing itself. It's just, it's just saying, Hey, you know what this thing is? There's only 10 of them. (laughs) So you probably want it. (laughs) If you want some of my coins, my Reese coins, there's not that many. So it's must be valuable. Um, So, you know, and Amazon is actually one of my favorite examples of this, but they'll say things like there's only two of this book left in stock. And it's like, I know you have a warehouse full of those books. Um, and so don't tell me there's only two left, but they, they're using it to say, oh my God, there was not much left. So you got to do it. Um, that's his final one, scarcity. So that's influence is uh, all these different ways to kind of get people to to say yes to things um, based off of these kind of tribal and kind of instinctual behavioral psychological instincts that we have that are good. All these are based in good things, you know, um, but people start to use them, A-B test them and push them. That's when you can kind of use them in your own product to behaviorally influence your people to do stuff. Um, talking about behavioral influence, uh, this other one's called Hooked. Um, and Hooked is, you know, outlines a framework. Um, if influence is about kind of acquisition and getting people to do things initially, Hooked is really about the habits and kind of retaining people and getting them to do stuff over time. Um, and, you know, the classic example here these days is probably like Facebook and kind of Facebook addicting you to their news feed in order to get more time out of you in order to make more money through advertisers. So let's talk about this model. Um, it has four parts uh uh, the trigger, so the beginning and like what what gets you to do an action, and the second part is then the action itself. Uh, the third one is the variable reward, so what do you get for doing the action, and specifically it needs to be a variable reward, not just the same thing every time. And then finally, investment, how do you get people to essentially do that commitment consistency thing above where then they feel invested in it um, and then need to start doing those actions and rewards again in the future. Um, 
So let's talk about triggers here. And triggers um, are, there's kind of two kinds of triggers. There's an external trigger and an internal trigger. An external trigger is something like a push notification where uh, it blinks on your phone and says, ooh, you know, there's awesome new news today. You know, like check this thing out. That's an external trigger um, that says, hey, use our thing. Um, take this action. And then those external triggers, once you do those enough, so let's say in the morning, you know, New York Times is pinging you every morning when you wake up, hey, check out the news, hey, check out the news, hey, check out the news, that external trigger will eventually become an internal trigger um, where you actually then start to say, oh, um, the moment you wake up in the morning, you're just used to checking New York Times. You don't even need the push notification anymore. So that's kind of the goal of any product is to make an external trigger turn into an internal trigger where it's like every day you go on to Facebook, not because Facebook tells you to, but because you're so used to it. Um, so then now the second one is this action. Um, and taking this action, uh, they get, dive into this, uh, what's called the fog behavioral model. And that is a, it's called B equals MAT, which is really the behavior equals um, the motivation, the ability, and then the trigger. We already talked about the trigger. Um, the motivation, the ability are the two key ones here. And the motivation is kind of how much does someone want to do something? So you can kind of think of this as how important is this job that they're doing? How important is their job to be done? Um, and then the other thing here is the ability. So how easy is it to do this? Um, so you can imagine kind of a graph between those two where if something's really, if they're really motivated to do it, even if it's really hard to do, they're probably still going to do it. Um, but let's say if something's, you know, if there's low motivation to do something, well, it has to be pretty easy to do in order to kind of uh, motivate to actually do that thing. Um, so this is to say that like, and, and, and the crucial takeaway from Hooked here is that you really want to make your stuff so easy to do um, because people are generally not motivated to do things. Um, and so if you just make every little thing as easy as possible, make every little, make each little step break down to all these little sub steps that they're really easy um, so that even if the motivation is not that high, it's easy to do. So they're going to do it. Once you trigger them to do it, it's really easy to open a push notification. So boom, that's that starts them off and gets, gets them going with this um, habit. So that's kind of the second piece here, which is the action and really to, to do an action to make it really easy to do, um, especially if they're not that motivated to do it. The third piece here is, you know, the variable reward. And the, you kind of need this variable reward in order to keep people coming back um, and, and to really habitualize them. So to think about this variable reward, the easiest way to think about it is this like um, – uh, the, like a slot machine is the classic example of variable reward where you say this thing happens oh my god what am I going to get oh I got some coins and that's why slot machines are super addictive and you can play them for hours and hours um, because we are habitualized uh, with variable reward and, and like excitement and those kinds of things um, so I really love the, the way that he, um, the author here, Near Isle, uh, breaks down hooked into the, and specifically the variable reward to these three different pieces. The first one is called rewards of the tribe. And these are essentially social rewards. So this is like when you post a Facebook status and you like are like, oh my God, do other people like it or do they not like it? This is kind of a big status. You post it and then 10 minutes later you check it. And you're like, oh my God, do people like it? Oh, yes, 10 people liked it. Awesome. Uh, or, oh no, only two people liked it. So that's kind of what rewards the tribe is. And you don't, it's, it's variable because you don't know how much the rest of the world out there is going to like or dislike something. Um, so that's kind of the social variable reward. There's also what's called rewards of the hunt, which is really like discovery here. So this is like anytime that there's a feed, they're using rewards of the hunt where, you know, you go on to Twitter, you go on to Facebook and you're like, oh, what's happened today? And you start scrolling and you don't really know uh, what's going to be on that thing. It could be awesome. It could be not that awesome. Maybe it'll take two scrolls to find something you're really interested in. Maybe it'll take 10 scrolls. Maybe that day you won't find anything interesting, whatever. Um, that's what the rewards of the hunt are, is essentially any kind of discovery mechanism where you're essentially showing people, oh, what could be not, what not cool, not cool. Oh, my God, this is so awesome. I'm so glad I went onto Twitter today because I found this cool article. Um, that is rewards of the hunt. Final one here is rewards of the self, where you kind of uh, anything that's been gamified is essentially a rewards of the self, where you 
take it and you um, you say, hey, uh, you're kind of leveling yourself up here um, and you were uh, beginning a noob and now you're awesome. Uh, that's a rewards of the self and it can be variable, especially when you, and this is what I would call like the chestification of games. So this is where like almost all games these days have given rewards now in terms of not the same reward every time. Not like you've automatically leveled up, but rather like, ooh, here's a chest, and you need to open up that chest, and if you get awesome things in the chest, then you'll level up. Um, so these are all variable, kinds of variable rewards that, that you can use in order to get people to um, to be more habitualized and to, hook, to be hooked to your product. Um, the final piece here is in what's called investment. And investment is really this commitment consistency thing from before where you ask the user. It's kind of weird, but you ask the user after you've given them this reward, um, it's kind of also reciprocation. After you said, oh my God, you got this, let's say you just logged into Facebook and boom, you get a like or whatever. After you, after that happens, then a lot of these platforms will ask you to do something. Oh, well, now that you're really excited about the platform, you should now add your phone number or add your email address or whatever. Um, and when you do that, then it gets you in this mindset that you're really hook, you're, you get more invested in the platform and you feel like you need to stay around because – if you left later, then why was your first self being so dumb? Why did he, um, he or she, you know, sign, you know, add your phone number to the thing if you were going to get rid of it later? So, well, you shouldn't get rid of it later because then it makes sure that your past self and your future self are consistent. So that's what Hooked is. And this is a really powerful model as we've seen with um, things like Facebook, things like any of the mobile app games, Candy Crush, all these things that kind of addict you and retain you in their product. And... I've, I just want to reemphasize for people that are using this, please, please, please use what's called this two by two, this manipulation matrix where you think about, hey, if you're making the thing, if you don't use the thing itself, you should be kind of worried, you know, um, and if you don't use the thing itself, if you're making it for others, um, even if you make it for others, it, so that's one axis is whether you use it or whether you don't use it. The other axis is whether you think it actually improves the user's life. Um, so let's kind of use Candy Crush as an example here. Let's say you're a maker of Candy Crush. You're a person who makes it but doesn't use it, and you don't think it helps people, but you're still using these addictive behavioral techniques. That's probably bad. <laughs> it's different, though. Let's say if you – like I love the app Headspace, which is a meditation app. Let's say you're a maker of Headspace. You use Headspace, and you think it really improves your life You know, because science says so. Um, then that feels good. So just make sure that you're kind of uh, being aware of, of, of the morality inherent <laughs> essentially in manipulating people. Okay. So we've kind of been deep in these, um, you know, we took uh, the high level view, prioritizing work within a startup, within any kind of, and within your life general, what are your assumptions? What are your biggest risks? Going through those things. Then later, you know, we talked about, you know, iterating to product market fit, you know, you know, understanding these different frameworks to understand um, how customers think and to really empathize with them, um, that kind of thing. And then we talked about once you're really starting to build your product, how do you loop in behavioral psychology in there to get people to say yes and to stay around for longer. This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift.io, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, Ether, Dash, Bitcoin Cash, Augur, Golem, and many more. And this is not your typical crypto exchange. You don't need to create an account or share your personal information, and your funds are never stored on Shapeshift. This means that your hard-earned digital wealth is never up for grabs by hackers or other malicious actors. To get started, visit shapeshift.io, choose the tokens you'd like to swap, input your receiving address, and send your funds. It's that easy. Now let's kind of take a step back and kind of go to the more kind of human side here, not thinking externally necessarily um, with the customers, but rather internally within the organization. So we're going to first talk about organization design and then talk about um, kind of communication patterns. So with organization design, the idea here is we're going to talk about how should information and capital and decisions be, you know, how should the things flow and be made within a company? Um, and with organization design, we're going to talk about two books here. One is called Reinventing Organizations. And another one is called Managing for Happiness. And these books aren't the, I wouldn't say that they're the primary books on organization design. Excuse me. But I would say that they are the, the books that I most conform to with organization design. So 
you know, uh, there's a, like a, a classic book called High Output Management, which is a great organizational design book and how to manage and those kind of things. But I like to kind of focus on these two books because I think they're called like essentially the future of, of organization design. So with that, let's talk about reinventing organizations. Um, and reinventing organizations, whew, I love this book. Um, and it's a new way to kind of think about organization design, especially in our you know fast moving world. And the kind of uh, macro thesis is that our organizations have changed. Um, the structure of our organizations has changed over time as our context has changed. Um, you know, so if you think back in time, you know, you know, way back in the day, you know, we used to think of ourselves as, you know, I like to think of, you know, industrial revolution times. We used to think of ourselves kind of as a machine, um, what they call orange. They give it the orange color label. And this is where we're kind of results driven. This is kind of a high output management kind of mindset. You know, it's a meritocracy. You know, people are cogs in the machine. Their inputs, their outputs. Um, you know, th that's kind of that mindset here, there. Then, as we kind of transitioned, we've transitioned into um, instead of thinking of ourselves in organizations as a as a machine, think of ourselves as a family. Um, and as a family, this is kind of what you know. Instead of a results driven organization, more of like a culture driven organization. So these are kind of these new Silicon Valley. Um, uh, companies that are like, you know, welcome to the Slack culture, welcome to the Facebook culture, you know, we're really like a family here. Um, and this is all about, you know, the words empowerment, um, you know, the words, you know, really defining values, you know, that kind of stuff is, is, is really great. And as part of this, it's kind of what they say as green. So if orange was the machine, green is the family. And that was kind of where we are at today, but where we're going and where the exciting stuff is, is, um, you know, thinking of ourselves as not as a machine or as a family, but thinking of organizations as a living organism. And so this is what they call teal, the color teal, not like Peter Teal. Um, and, and, and instead of being kind of culture driven, these are relationship driven. So, you know, the key concepts here are kind of self-management, where it's kind of a bottom up thing where you're like, yo, this is what I'm going to be doing allocate my time here, allocate my time here. You know, this is like the new freelancer economy is kind of part of this. Um, another key part of this is like being whole, like bringing your whole self to work. Um, not saying I have my work self and I have my, you know, profession and I have my life self. It's like, no, no, no. You can be yourself at any given time throughout life. Um, and really the other key here here is thinking about, you know, what is the kind of evolutionary purpose of the the organism that you're working within? Um, so really pushing that biology theme and saying like, whoa, how does like where where is this thing going? Kind of letting the thing decide sometimes. Um, so this 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 teal thing I think is powerful um, from a couple different perspectives. Um, and, and, and before I talk about those perspectives, first it's if you've heard of Zappos and their holacracy, um, essentially a very flat organization without managers. Um, that's what Teal is. It's it's a it's a very flat organization um, that's really bottom up. And um, for for other listeners of my show, it's I'm mostly in the blockchain world, and and Teal is very very connected to the blockchain world. Um, and you can think of this this tech society loop um, where you know tech informs society and society informs tech. You can also think of it as like Conway's law, um, where the thing that you're building looks and the thing that you're coding looks like you you and you look like it um so the, you know the code determines you and you determine the code um you essentially each determine each other's structures so that's pretty much true with you know teal is the kind of human relationship version you know the organism that's the same version as blockchain um where blockchain is you know peer-to-peer -peer, you know relationship driven kind of in code um so this is to say that um, we're starting to see this, but I expect more and more companies um, that are making, that are doing teal, that are doing blockchain work to, to, to define themselves as teal organizations um, because they're essentially the same thing just in whether you're in code space or whether you're in human space. So with that, when you're making a teal organization, um, I would say that there are a couple of awesome things that you can do. The top ones for me are um, one that I love within the self-management thing is like, so, so a macro point here actually is that 
it's not like a teal organization um, or teal organism is just like, well, everybody does what they want. Let's hope it works out. Um, there's still lots of like uh, codified ways that people operate, but they're just much more bottom up and much more peer to peer relationship driven. Um, and one of them is like how you make decisions and you make decisions through what's called an advice process where anybody can make any decision, but they need to check with those who are affected by it and domain experts. So this essentially allows you to say, hey, um, uh, I'm going to make this awesome decision. It, does it actually affect anybody else? Or is like, is there anyone an expert on this? No. Okay, sweet. I'm going to make it myself. Oh, actually, this decision is one where it's going to affect all these people over here. I'm going to check in with them. What are their thoughts on it? Or, oh, man, I know this awesome expert that made a similar decision you know, a year ago. Let me ask him or her about it. So that's kind of this advice process. Who is affected by it and who are the experts about it? That's how you should make a decision is by incorporating those people. Um, the other awesome thing that I love in, in the self-management thing is this conflict resolution mechanism um, where you're really trying to, at the beginning, try to resolve the conflict in a peer-to-peer -peer way. You know, it's Teal's all about peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, just resolve with the other person. If that doesn't work, add in a third-party moderator. If that doesn't work, add a panel. And that's pretty much just the way to resolve all conflict. Um, the other thing to say here is... Um, yeah, I will talk about it. So with wholeness, um, it, the coming to your work as your full self, uh, a great way to do this is to have these meeting practices where you um, you can be silent for a minute or you can express gratitude. Um, those are good ways to kind of bring your kind of more emotional, your other self into your work. Um, another good way to, to, to kind of bring wholeness there is to kind of redesign the physical space to jolt people out of the classic office mindset. So this is like no cubicles, you know, um, making crazy stuff everywhere, you know, like that, you know, allowing people to be themselves. That's another part of this being whole thing. Uh, and the final piece here is this evolutionary purpose. Um, and really the key thing here is to check in hiring. Hey, do you have, you know, people talk about culture alignment a lot. Um, and this is essentially checking for purpose alignment. So say, Hey, do you want this organism to thrive? Um, you know, do you want the blockchain Ethereum ecosystem to thrive? If so, boom, you have pur purpose alignment here. Um, the other thing that you can do here, just like the physical representation and wholeness of the physical space, you can physically represent the living organism through an empty chair in the room or through some, some physical object, and that allows you to kind of personify it and then to use it and to kind of ask it questions <laughs> um, and to think about it in the conversation. So, with that, that is Teal. It's an awesome, it's essentially the blockchain equivalent of an organization design. Um, and they will converge, and it will be cool, and we will all be a hyper-networked human organism. Um, now let's talk about this other one called Managing for Happiness. Uh, this is part of this, um, it's by this guy, Jürgen, Jürgen Apello, uh, who is is really on the cutting edge of this these management design philosophies and he's has this concept called management 3.0 it's connected to this thing called sociocracy 3.0 um and managing for happiness has these 11 specific how-to chapters that kind of dive into the teal things that we talked about before it's very very aligned with the teal thoughts um but but the one that i want to say from those uh, 11 is this this delegation these seven layers of delegation um and making a decision and this, I think, is just crucial for if you're a decentralized organization, if you're a TO organization, coming to consensus can be really hard. It can also sometimes feel like a binary. It's like, okay, either everyone has to agree on this or like a single person needs to make a dictatorial decision here. Um, but actually, there are these seven layers of de delegation, which um, he talks about. So one of them is um, you can tell someone. So this is essentially making the decision as the manager saying, this is going to happen. You go do it. The decision's been made. Um, the second one is selling, where you kind of convince people about it, where you say, hey, the decision's been made, but what are your thoughts on it? You know, here's what I'm thinking, blah, blah, blah. The third one is consulting, um, where you're like, hey, um, I'd love to get all your guys' input on this or all your guys' and girls' input on this. I haven't made a decision yet, though, so, like, let's, let's kind of do a process here. Um, let's get some consulting, and then I'll go and make the final decision. So that's the consultant thing where you don't come with the decision made and sell it, but you rather consult and then make it later. Um, the fourth one is kind of at the middle of this gradient, um, and it's called agree. Um, and it's just making the decision together with the team where no one person has the – as the real power and you really uh, need to come to consensus there um, and then five six and seven are kind of the flip of one two and three where um, you know this fifth one is called advise and advise essentially the opposite of consulting where 
um, you know, you know that your team is going to make a decision or someone else is going to make a decision. They say, hey, I'd love to consult with you on this. Um, and then you can kind of advise them and kind of say, okay, great, here's here are my thoughts on it. But you go and you make the decision yourself. Um, so it's kind of the flip of consult. Um, and then the flip of selling is inquiring where um, – you know, the decision was made, you know, a decision has been made by the team. Um, you know, there's like, hey, this decision's been made, but I'd love to kind of, uh, you know, here's our mindset, here's our reasoning. I'd love for feedback on it. I'd love to get some feedback. Um, that's kind of the opposite of selling it to, to the team. Um, and the seventh one here is delegating, where, you know, if, you know, if telling is the first one, you're just saying, um, this is happening, let's rock and roll. Um, delegating is like, yo, you do your thing. <laughs> I have no influence. You work it out. So I love those seven and uh, those seven different levels, especially because they're the flip of each other as ways to kind of um, uh, think about the, making a decision and decision making, especially within a decentralized um, uh, organization like Teal. Okay, so those are organization designs specifically around these new kinds of um, cutting edge living organism based um, organizations. Okay, so. Now that we've thought about the organization and the kind of human relationships within an organization from the system level, like, you know, from the TO perspective, um, now we can kind of think about each of those individual peer-to-peer -peer relationships and think about how to communicate well within those. So we're going to talk about team communication here. Um, we're going to look at four different books in Everyone Culture, Five Dysfunctions of Team, Nonviolent Communication, and Radical Candor. Uh, Radical Candor. And they kind of overlap in this kind of beautiful way um, that we'll talk about at the end. So let's start with an everyone culture. Um, and both an everyone culture and five dysfunctions of a team are kind of a little bit more system level, um, while nonviolent communication and radical candor are more about like tactics within communication. Um, so an everyone culture is this awesome science-heavy book um, around creating cultures of self-improvement, what they call a developmentally driven organization or a DDO. Um, and there are kind of three key parts of a DDO. Um, there is the the groove, which are these kind of developmental practices, essentially habitualizing um, learning, essentially, you know, making it regular, making feedback, you know, thing, making sure you're talking about the process level, at the machine level, what they sometimes call it. Um, that's the groove, essentially. It's just making sure you have these practices set in place um, and, and, and supported. And supported. Um, the other key one here is called the home. Um, and the home is making sure, kind of thinking about like a safe space. So this is like psychological safety, making sure the leader, him or herself is vulnerable. You know, how do you view conflict? How do you view authority? Making sure those things are kind of, um, if conflict is okay, you know, working with authority is okay. And, and kind of going back to the wholeness that we talked about this before, you know, appreciating the whole self, you know, um, being open about the whole self. That's kind of what home is about, is making sure you feel kind of safe in the environment. Um, and the final one here is, once you have your groove, you know, you have a, essentially, you know, you're going to be working and iterating through these things. Once you feel safe, um, then you kind of get that edge. So this is like, where do you want to learn? Um, and so this is kind of making mistakes, you know, finding the problems. Where's your growing edge? Where's our growing edge as, as, as a group of, of people? Um, and so that's essentially just like, what are you trying to learn? So once that's essentially the three key ways uh, that a DDO operates is by having um, a, a groove, they have this systematized, they have the home to be safe, and then they have the edge to essentially learn and push forward. Um, and so with that, they also have this great kind of immunity to change map, which is a specific way to help people um, change these deeply held behaviors. So essentially what you do with it is you kind of ask yourself these kind of why questions. You say, hey, I commit to, um, you know, waking up earlier or whatever. And then you start to ask yourself these why questions. Well, what are my worries around that? What are some of these commitments that I have? What am I committed to? And as you start to work through that, you get to this big assumptions column where you're like, oh my God, what are these assumptions that I hold about why I'm not waking up early? And you, you kind of get there and you're like, oh my God, these are ridiculous assumptions um, that are, that these assumptions in this kind of worldview is kind of a story that I'm telling myself in order to continue doing this thing and to still continue to do something, to commit to it. Um, and to, you, you have these worries about changing. It's like, no, no, no. All those things are just assumptions. You can go and you can change and you can be a better person. Um, so I really recommend people use this immunity to change or the ITC map as a way. If you're trying to change something within yourself and you're trying to find your edge, um, 
choose a really big awesome goal and it's something that you've been that you think would be awesome to change and then use an immunity to change map in order to break down um, what's stopping you from changing it um, the other thing here is that I love this book's um, KPI or their OMTM, their one metric that matters for a DDO, what's called the frankness score. And this is saying, you know, from one to 10, this is asking everybody in the organization, from one to 10, how frank are you with each other on matters of importance to how the business is run? So it's like, hey, how often do you hide things? You know, if you're like, well, I'm always walking on eggshells and I never really tell anybody about anything and there's all kinds of problems, but they're not my problem. Um, you know, if you have like a low score there, that means you don't have a good DDO that, you know, everybody's keeping things from each other all the time. Um, if you think, oh, I can't tell my boss that because he or she's my boss or, you know, like I don't like conflict. It's like, no, no, no. The whole goal is to be frank, <laughs> you know, um, to be honest, that's how you kind of learn. So. I think that's a crucial mindset for people to take within a company. Say, you're really trying to optimize for for frankness and to, to make sure that everybody's frank with each other about important things. Okay, so that is an everyone culture. Also, look at everyone culture for its really good takes on kind of uh, intelligence and how the mind kind of operates over time. They have this really cool thing where they say... Um, uh, you know, one mind is kind of like the socialized mind where you exist as the world tells you to exist, essentially. The next one is called the, I think, self-transforming mind or something like that, where you're kind of aware of your, um, it's not just, you don't just operate in a socialized way. You're kind of aware of what you've been socialized to do and to think, but um, you don't actively change it. Uh, and then the third way is one where you both you're not socialized. You, you you see the lens that you're viewing the world through, which is like the self-transformed mind or whatever, but you're also kind of flexible around it. So you're actively putting on these different mental frameworks and whatever, and actively always thinking about the lens that you're viewing the world through um, in addition to how you're viewing the world. So that's just a good way to think about um, uh, your own progression as a human over time is what lenses are you viewing the world through and hopefully you're actively putting on all these different lenses throughout time know their different pros and cons uh, and that's a great way to um, grow and to make decisions okay so let's talk about five dysfunctions of a team which is another awesome book um about uh, how a organization should run. Um, and uh, this one talks about these dysfunctions. And the dysfunctions, it's kind of a pyramid um, uh, where you kind of start at the bottom and you need to have uh, the bottom correct in order to work higher up the pyramid. Um, and so the bottom is this absence of trust. So if you don't have trust in specifically what they call vulnerability-based trust, um, then you can't uh, then you can't go further up the pyramid. And, you know, the this trust, it, let's actually, let's talk about the, it's kind of, you need to keep two of the parts of the pyramid in your mind at all times in order to understand. So if you don't have trust, then essentially you can't have conflict with each other. Um, and this is what they mean by like, like, hey, um, you know, the frankness score above, the how safe are you, that kind of thing. If you feel like you're in an organization, you can't feel, and you don't feel like you can show your vulnerabilities or to show your weaknesses, then you're going to be afraid of conflict because you're going to be afraid, that, oh, well, people just hate on me for that or whatever. Um, and so you really need to have vulnerability-based trust within a, a corporation and within a company. And you build it by the leaders leading first and building that and actively saying, I'm bad at this. And this is something that's vulnerable for me. And it's kind of scary by showing all those things and showing that those things don't get pounced on. And that's just like you, that you can actually show that you're kind of, that you have weaknesses and that you don't just get fired immediately or like, you know, ostracized for having them. That's a crucial underlying layer that you need to have within a business. Um, and, and within any communication. So once you have that trust, um, then you move up to the next thing of, you know, fear of conflict. So so this is, you know, disagreement. You need to be able to disagree with each other. And you need to disagree with each other in order to get to the third stage, which is to commit to something. Um, because you can imagine um, a version of things where it's like, okay, we're thinking about doing this thing as a company. But, you know, I don't really agree with it, but I can't really disagree with it. Um, so I guess it's happening. And then once it happens, then you don't actually commit to it because you're like, well, I didn't even want that to happen. <laughs> um, and so this is what they call, uh, what someone like Amazon calls disagree and commit, where you really 
if someone's talking about a decision, you need to go in deep to it. You need to be able to disagree with each other without feeling personally attacked because you have that vulnerability-based trust. Um, you know, can't be avoidant of conflict. And then as you do all that, then you can, once you have those things, then once you've disagreed, then you can really feel like you commit to the decision. Even if it wasn't yours, you feel like your voice has been heard. Um, so then once you commit to something, um, you know, you really do need to commit to it. Uh, and that's the third thing, which is a lack of commitment. And if you have that lack of commitment, then you'll essentially um, get to the next layer, which is avoiding accountability. Um, so this is the thing where it's like, hey, once you've that, built that trust, then you start conflicting, then you start disagreeing about things. That's awesome. You come to these conclusions. You're like, okay, if we've come to these conclusions. Then you need to commit to, to, to those actions um, because – once you, if you don't commit to those actions, then you're not accountable for them. Because if you're like, well, I never even committed. Yeah, we had that conversation, but I didn't even commit to the thing. So I don't feel accountable for it failing. Um, that's your problem. You know, you were the one who wanted this to happen. Um, so that's what, uh, why you need to have this, this commit commitment here. You need to commit to the direction that has been decided. And then once you have that, then you can be accountable for your results um, and take accountability for success, take, take accountability for failure. Uh, and that's the fourth level, fourth level. And then the fifth level is results, um, which isn't, I haven't really seen it be too much of an, an issue, but this is mainly when people optimize for their self um, results rather than for team results. Um, so this is a thing where you say, okay, we're all accountable as a team for this one metric that matters that we all trusted each other, disagreed and committed to, and are now accountable to this team result. So that's pretty much how non, how uh, five dysfunctions of a team works. Um, cool. Now let's talk. So those are kind of, um, you know, DDOs and uh, five dysfunctions of a team are kind of, again, a little bit system level about how they operate and like um, the layers that they operate on. Now let's talk about nonviolent communication, which is simply a framework for communicating well with others. And it is beautiful. Um, and it is uh, especially powerful for communicating emotions. Um, what you do is you essentially state your observations, then state your feelings, then state your needs, and then state your requests. And you do all this in I language. And as you're doing that, then the other person is essentially doing reflective listening and reflecting back those statements. Um, and this is possible because like you can, it's easy to get into these heated emotional conversations, which and emotions are complex and abstract and whatever. And you take that and instead you kind of break it down into the subconcepts, those observations, feelings, needs, and requests, and then get clarity around those concepts through those reflective listening. Like, is this what you said? Oh, okay, no, you were actually saying this, blah, blah. Okay, so here's the framework. And a funny thing with this framework is that it, you know, this stuff might feel awkward to kind of bring into the work atmosphere, right? Where it's like, well, we don't talk about our feelings at work. Um, and that's tempting, but but those two things, those two articles or the two books from before, all about being bringing your whole self into work, making sure you can be vulnerable, making sure you can show your emotions. So, being able to be emotional at work is crucial. I mean, if we're all just rational, logical human beings, that's bad. <laughs> we need to be able to to show our emotions and to be able to to operate in this emotional way because that's it's. If you have underlying fears and underlying, you know, worries and, and, and scaredness and shame, then you, you're trying to operate on these rational levels, but you kind of have these root level problems that you're not working through. Um, so really push for and lean into the emotions here. And you do that by, as I said here, these subconcepts in this four-part framework where you say, when I observe something. So you say, when I don't see, when I, when I see you ignore the trash when it's full. Um, and the second part is the feelings part. I feel, you know, annoyed. Uh, and then the third part is the need, uh, where you say, because I need, and, and the crucial one here is, um, it's, it's a self need. It's not something where you, you say, I feel annoyed because you, blah, 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 blah. No, it's like, what is your need that's being unfilled here um it's this one is always a really difficult one you say well because i need oh, well what do i need here i just really want you to take out the trash it's like well what needs that solving maybe it's because i need to feel confident or because i need to feel comfort in my own home and that we're a team or whatever um so that's the need one and then uh the final one here is the request where you say and i request that you blah 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 and the request one is great because so there's two notes on it one is it's not a demand it's not like i demand you do this it's like well i request that you do that 
do this. And if you do it, then it would solve my need. That's that's the idea. But but they can kind of deny the request or make maybe propose a different kind of version of request that would solve the same need, whatever. Um, so it's it's a, it's a great way to get people to do things without forcing them to. Um, and the other thing with requests is that they need to be positive facing. So it's not like I request that you stop blah 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 or that you don't blah blah blah. It's like no, I request you're you're telling people to take an action. Um, it's kind of this positive facing framework on it. Um, and the beautiful thing with this NVC model is that also it just really ally allows people to come to alignment um, where you say, hey, I have these needs and you understand them and they're making these requests. You're like, I can't really solve those requests. And you're like, well, maybe we're just not aligned. You know, your needs are ones that I can't fill or I can't meet um, through these requests. Um, so so it might not it might not work. So uh, that's what I love about the NVC model. The other thing that I love here is that it just aligns super well, especially the reflective listening piece really um, aligns well with one of Stephen Covey's, Stephen Covey's uh, habits of highly, seven habits of highly effective people, which we'll talk about in a second, um, which is seek first to understand, then to be understood, where it's like when someone's there, it, they're feeling emotional, they're feeling sad, really try to understand them, really try to reflectively lis listen there, and then later you can be understood. It's also similar to Khalil Gibran's quote, um, which says, between what is said and what is not, and what is said and what is, sorry, between what is said and not meant, and what is meant and not said, most of love is lost. Um, so this is this key clarification piece where you, your people are saying things, um, but then they actually meant this other stuff, or like, you know, you know, I meant to say these things, but I never said them. Um, that's where a lot of love gets lost. So you, this is just the reflective listening is a great way to clarify these things. Um, and I like to think of this as like the meant said heard differential, um, where people are, someone's on the other side. What they mean to say is that they don't like cats. What they end up saying is that they hate cats. And what you hear them saying is that you, they want to kill your cat. And it's like, well. We got a, there's a there's a delta between each between what they meant and what they said and between what they said and what you heard. Um, so make sure you just kind of clarify those differentials. Uh, one final note here is that there's this awesome NVC feelings wheel uh, that you can check out in the article, which has these six positive and six negative emotions, each of which is the flip of each other. Um, it's just this great way to understand uh, feelings. I'll even say it right now. So so you know if you think about uh, anger. Anger is kind of like judgment at someone else, annoyance at someone else. And, and the flip of that is, is kind of feeling peace or feeling acceptance of someone else. Um, another version here is kind of for the, the negative one is ashamed, feeling self-judgment. So being like, oh, I'm ashamed of myself. Oh, I'm embarrassed. Oh, this is awkward. Um, versus feeling, being self-accepting, feeling proud, have, being empowered, feeling self-confident. Um, so those are kind of the flip of each other. So the other one is feeling sad about loss. Something has happened. You feel depressed. You feel unhappy. And the other side of this is feeling joyful from the gain that happened, feeling happy, feeling grateful. Um, so those are kind of flips of each other. The other one is two, ver two versions of surprise. One of them is like, whoa, I'm like negatively surprised, kind of caught off guard, you know, startled, overwhelmed, astonished by this. Um, the other version is kind of being like intrigued, you know, kind of being attentive, you know, curious, fascinated, engaged by the surprise. Um, this other one is being afraid of something, feeling like something is, is a threat, feeling not safe, feeling scared, feeling vulnerable, insecure, and anxious. Um, the other version of that is feeling you know, feeling secure and safe and trusting, um, feeling, you know, hopeful and assured about the situation. So those are kind of opposites of each other. The final one here is um, being kind of disgusted by something, being kind of repulsed by it. So not necessarily judging, but just being like, oh, that's disgusting. I, you know, being averse to it, feeling contempt, whatever, um, versus being attracted to it, feeling loving towards it, um, connected, caring, adoration, those kind of things. So it's just awesome that there are all these uh, feelings that we can express here are kind of, it's great to think of them as a six dimensional flip of each other, though, where you have you know, the negative version on the other side and the flip of it, the positive version on one side. Okay, so the final um, thing on communication here is radical candor, uh, which is this great little framework um, that has, uh, that's very similar to some of the stuff that we've been talking about above that says, hey, radical candor is when you care personally about someone and you challenge them directly. That creates more positive work environments. Um, and that essentially just like creates frankness, you know, um, and they have this great uh, two by two where, you know, if you care personally about someone 
and you challenge directly. Well, that's radical candor. That's awesome. You care about them as a person. You know, there's a trusting, safe, secure environment, whatever, and you challenge them directly. And you say, mm, you're kind of being bad right now. Um, there's another version of that where you care personally, but you don't actually challenge directly. And this is what's called ruinous empathy. You're like, oh, I care so much about you. Oh, I really exp- I know what you're at. But you're not telling them about all these bad things that they're doing. Um, there's on the flip side, what if you don't care personally? Um, but you do challenge directly where you this is essentially just like the jerk in the office and this is what they she calls obnoxious aggression where you're actively challenging directly but you don't actually care personally you're just being negative all the time or whatever um and the final piece here is where you don't care personally and you don't challenge directly and this is what they call manipulative insincerity um so that's a, a great two by two and let's talk about like the framework overlap between uh these books and you know the first one is thinking from like five dysfunctions of a team, that kind of layer of trust to disagree and commit, that's very, very similar to the everyone culture, um, the KPI or the OMTM for developmentally driven organizations for DDOs, which is how frank are you? Um, You know, so you aren't frank if you don't have the trust to then disagree and commit, you know, so they're kind of, they're different ways to say a very similar thing. Um, And radical candor is similar as well, where it's like, hey, you build trust by caring personally and then disagree and commit by challenging directly. Um, the other one here is, you know, with nonviolent communication, it's really, it gives you that communication framework to really be truly frank with people. It can be, it can be, um, you know, building that that first layer of NVC, that vulnerability based trust. It's tough to do that if you don't have a good framework to to be vulnerable about your emotions. And it's also tough to um, if you can't be vulnerable about you know what you're seeing in other people and being like, hey, the way you're operating in the office it makes me feel like this because I need this and I request blah, blah, blah. That's a very powerful way to kind of talk about and to be frank with others. Um, And so I really like this kind of team facing one metric that matters that kind of combines multiple of these frameworks. And it is essentially this on matters of importance to the business from one to 10. How often do you one speak frankly and vulnerably and then two, listen curiously and empathetically. So this is just a way to say, instead of just being, hey, how frank are you within the organization? It's like it, it, it operates within the system as well. It says, hey, maybe they're not being frank because people aren't being listening curiously and empathetically. So got to speak frankly, speak vulnerably, be out there saying, being honest. And then also, if you're on the receiving end, please listen curiously, listen empathetically. Um, if you have those two things and you're a, you know, a nine, a 10 or a 10 of 10 for that, I think you probably have a good um, organizational structure. Okay. Um, so moving away from uh, organizational design and team communication, let's talk about the self here. So just a couple of quick mental models for the self to wrap up. And we're going to be talking about thinking fast and slow, essentialism, refuse to choose seven habits of highly effective people and designing your life. Um, So these are good frameworks and mental models to use kind of just in isolation, um, whether you're at work or not, (laughs) or whether you're in a community or whether you're in a relationship or not. This is just for you as a person. Okay, so let's start with thinking fast and slow. And the the high level point of this book is um, it outlines these cognitive biases through this uh, mental abstraction of system one, which is your kind of quick and intuitive brain, versus system two, which is kind of the slower, more rational, more rational brain. Um, and you kind of break all cognitive processing down to system one or system two, and I just like to always ask myself, hey, is this my system one thinking here, or is this my system two thinking here? Um, You know, system one thinking, boom, quick decisions, really helpful in certain situations. But system two is like the longer, more thoughtful kind of operating as a computer thing. Um, And the cognitive biases that can result from system one thinking, um, there are lots of them. Uh, And this guy, Buster Benson, uh, a product lead at Slack, he did this awesome job breaking down these 200 cognitive biases into these four primary groups. So instead of understanding all the different kinds of cognitive biases, I really like to think of just these groupings. Um, And so the first one is like, hey, information overload, it sucks. Um, So we aggressively filter stuff. But some of the stuff that we filter out might actually be useful. Mm -mm. Um, Second one here is like lack of meaning is confusing. So let's say stuff stuff got in through the filter, um, but it's like, well, what does this actually mean? So we like actively fill in the gaps. But by doing this, by searching for meaning, conjuring illusions, telling stories, we can kind of 
imagine details that were filled in with our assumptions um, that wasn't actually true. Um, and the other thing here is that like, hey, you know, once we have something, we we need to like act fast. Let's say we need to act fast. Unless we lose our chance, we like jump to conclusions. But like some of these quick decisions can be flawed. Um, and so some of these quick reactions and decisions, uh, that decision making after we've gotten the information, it can be self-serving, unfair, counterproductive, whatever. Um, and then after that, after you've kind of done the input, after you've done the output, your, your mind starts to try to remember things. And um, it's like, hey, we're going to try to remember the important things. But man, um, our memory kind of reinforces these errors. Um, so we remember <coughs> the stuff that we remember for later. Um, it just makes all these systems above kind of more biased and, and more damaging to our thought processes. So this is essentially saying that like, as we remember stuff, really we're just kind of reinforcing things uh, instead of kind of breaking new ground. Um, so that's kind of what these cognitive biases are. And, and instead of understanding 200, just understand those four big buckets. If you wanna look online, there's this awesome mental map of the 200 different biases um, broken down into these those four buckets above. Um, the other key thing here that in thinking fast and slow in addition to those cognitive biases um, is this concept of uh, base traits and Bayesian reasoning. And this is one that's also used a lot in the rationalist community. Um, and this mental model, uh, it's essentially a way, it, it's something that our system one uh, does poorly a lot, but you can use base rates and Bayesian reasoning to kind of do better system two thinking. Um, and it's it's used to determine the probable, the, like probabilistic outcomes, um, so the likelihood of a given outcome. So whenever you're thinking about likelihood stuff, try to think about this Bayesian reasoning thing. Um, and essentially, it states that we need to be super aware of the likelihood of a given outcome before we get the evidence. Um, and this is what's called like the base rate or the prior, um, because determined before we determine the evidence. Um, so let's 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 give an example here to kind of walk through Bayesian reasoning. So. Let's say you see someone walking down on college campus, uh, and, and by the way, I take this from this awesome Julia Galloff piece um, where she explains a, a very similar um, case study. So let's say you see someone walking down on college campus, uh, this guy Tom, he like looks shy, and so someone asks you a question like, hey, is Tom more likely to be a math PhD or in business school? And you're like, well, Tom's pretty shy, so probably he's a math PhD. That didn't take into account the base rates. Um, and so essentially the base rate says, well, how many math PhDs are there in general? Well, not that many. Well, and how many, you know, business students are there? Well, probably a lot. So even though Tom looks shy and even though math PhDs are likely to be shy, um, Tom might be less likely to be a math PhD just because there's so many, um, because there's so many business students. Um, so you could like do the math here if you wanted to, um, but that's the, the crucial concept is to say, hey, let's take the rate of, uh, actually, let's do the math for a quick second. Let's take the rate um, of math PhDs in the school. So let's say the math PhDs in the school is 1%, um, and then the you know, business school, um, they're 10% of the school. So now let's take into account shyness. So let's say 75% of math PhDs are shy. Let's say that 15% of business students are shy. So now you can essentially compare those two likelihoods, those two ratios. Um, so you say, okay, well, Tom, likelihood that Tom is a math PhD, well, only well, you know 1% of the school is, are math PhDs and 75% uh, of them are shy. Um, and so it's a point zero, it's essentially 0.75%. Okay, this could be, Tom could be a math, uh, math PhD here. Um, and the math likelihood that he's a business student, well, 10% of the school is uh, our business students, and but only 15% of them are shy, well, that still gives you a 1.5% chance um, that Tom is in business school. Um, because, and so it's 1.5% for him being in business school and only 0.75% because he's a math PhD, and this all comes from base rates. So really, uh, base rates slash priors, understand those base rates or priors um, in order to to understand, to kind of create uh, probabilistic and, and to determine probabilities. Um, cool. So with that, um, one final note on that actually is that if you want to check out uh, other mental models in that vein, there's this great Farnham Street blog that has these mental models uh, that you can check out. Uh, so if you Google Farnham Street and mental models, you'll find some awesome uh, 113 great mental models that are similar to that one. Uh, in that vein. Okay, cool. So now let's talk about the second book, uh, Essentialism. And the key with Essentialism is just that, hey, there's a power law on things that provide you with happiness. Um, 
and that the social instinct is to say yes to things, especially in social situations. So we should really try to actively counteract that say yes mentality in pursuit of those awesome power law returns of A by actively saying no to most anything that's not an awesome like hell yes I want to do this. This is kind of a, a flip on life where mostly you're just thinking like yes is my natural instinct but really probably no maybe should be your natural instinct. Say no to lots and lots of things because then you can really optimize to say yes to the things that you really love. Um, and so part of this is um, at the beginning you do still need to do a two-step process where you say hey let's do a breath per search look at all these possibilities at a surface level say yes briefly to all of them prototype all of them oh man, these ones that are the awesomest, let's say, you know, hell yes to those, and then say no to everything else. Um, and then the other key thing here is, you know, to, a way to break down um, the social awkwardness by saying no, you know, and so it gives these great ways to gracefully say no to others. Um, and you can do this by saying, talking about the things that you're passionate about, talk about what you're saying yes to, say, oh yeah, I can't do this, but it's because I'm, I'm, Eating this awesome family, you know, this dinner with my family. Um, you can all say, hey, we can't do this now, but I'd love, you know, could you reach out in a week or in a couple months, um, you know, have more time then or whatever. Um, and the other thing is that you can say that you do care about them. So say, hey, I really love you. I care about you. But right now, <laughs> I'm having family dinners every night. <laughs> and so, and, and that's something I'm saying yes to. So uh, let's, could, could you reach back out in three months? So that is essentialism, uh, essentially a say no mindset uh, that allows you to say yes to the things that you love. Um, the second book, or the third book here is called Refuse to Choose. And this is a less well-known book, but I think is kind of crucial. It was crucial for me in my life. And I think it uh, might be crucial for other people's lives. And it's really it focused on, on these two different personality types, scanners, um, which are essentially intensely curious, jump around or whatever, versus kind of divers, which focuses on a specialty, you know, executing on that, whatever. Um, and for myself as a scanner, it was really helpful for me to read, but I also think it's helpful for divers to understand, understand scanners better. Um, so society has traditionally kind of looked down on scanners, you know, um, we've been, <laughs> we've been pushed down by the man, oh no, um, and, but really scanners just need to place themselves, you know, we're, we're looked down because like you can't focus, we, you know, you need to commit to something, blah, 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 but really scanners just need to place themselves in places where they can actually focus and do their scanning in a great way, um, so I like this optimal scanner progression, which is called the LTTL loop, or the learn, try, teach, leave loop. And what that looks like is a scanner kind of comes into an organization or a situation, learns for a short period of time, step one, tries out various solutions. Okay, understand that, okay, you know, blah, 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 great. Okay, understand what works, then teaches new people how to do them. Okay, that's step three. And then final step is to leave. Um, and, and as long as this is clear from the start, where you're like, hey, I'm kind of a scanner. I like this LTTL loop. People will be, they, then, then you can be okay with that and get in, try things, learn things, teach things, and then peace. Um, so the other, uh, that's that's one thing that I love from this book. The other top quotes that I like are, some scanners even think that being an expert would be limiting and boring. Um, so I kind of personally believe that to some extent where it's like, hey, being an expert at anything is like, oh, that would be just a box to put yourself in. Oh, my God, that's so limiting. Um, and the other funny one is, when it comes to commitment, many scanners draw the line. The horror of wasting their lives lose in front, lo looms in front of them, and avoiding commitment itself is the, often the only thing a scanner will commit to. Um, so this was actually great for me personally. I was doing an immunity to change map, and I and I, I wrote down into it the first step in immunity to change map is to commit to something, and I wrote down, I am committing to commit to things. Um, and I wrote that actually before I read this book, and then when I read this book, I was like, that is hilarious. That that's exactly me, you know, uh, I am so, I was bad at committing to things, um, but now I'm better by reading books and by immunity to change maps. Okay, cool. So let's talk about um, this fourth book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, and it has kind of seven frameworks that highly effective people use. Here are my top three. The first one is to begin with the end in mind. Um, so this is, you know, really making sure what is the goal, how will you measure success, um, and this is both true in business, but also in conversations. So I always love to quote unquote, go to the meta level and to check to make sure everyone has clarity around the goal. So this is like, if you're in an organizational setting, you're like, well, let's make sure, are we aligned around what the goal is here? Um, we might be talking past each other, you know, or if you're in a conversation, you're like, well, what are you trying to get out of this? You know, um, you gotta be aligned around the goal and then you can kind of dive down um, into actual the tactics and, and getting to work. Um, the other uh, key thing that I love from this book is 
to make, I think about your circle of concern and your circle of influence a lot. And so what this means is you're trying to make your circle of concern, aka what you care about and spend your attention on, trying to make that kind of equal to your circle of influence, like what you can affect. Um, and this is another way of saying, don't spend too much time on things that are outside of your control. Uh, and this is a kind of a sad thing that I see a lot of people do where they're like, they think about the world and they think about, oh my God, this sad thing is happening in Bangladesh and oh, did you just see what happened on the moon and blah, blah, and the Andromeda galaxy, whatever. It's like, you know, you have no, you have no influence over those things, so you shouldn't be concerned about them. Try to be concerned about the things that are within your circle of influence or try to expand your circle of influence so that you can be concerned about those things. Um, so that's the concept here. It's also pretty similar to this great um, first bucketing that I do when I feel stressed, um, which is to bucket things into the things I can control and the things I can control. You just start with that bucket, and essentially you're saying, what can I influence here or not? And you'll immediately realize there's like a lot of things that you're stressing out. You can't even control half of that stuff. So it's like, maybe don't stress about it, you know, just do do what you can. Um, cool. The, the final third piece here um, from this book is to be effective with people and then to be efficient with tasks. Um, so these are kind of uh, the words effective and efficient and leverage all kind of get kind of pushed into a similar bucket sometimes. But I really like this version of like, hey, when you're with people, spend your time, be effective with them. Stuff like nonviolent communication, it takes a long time. You know, it's, it's worth it to be effective there instead of ter- trying to be as efficient as possible. Um, but then once you have some tasks, woof, do them, be efficient with them. That's great. Um, you know, maximize your, your input, output, your cost benefit there. One final note on that one is I like to think about leverage. So if efficiency is essentially maximizing, uh, so, so, so leverage is when you spend, try and spend a little bit of effort for a lot of impact. Um, uh, efficiency is saying, okay, I know how much effort I'm going to spend given that much effort trying to maximize your impact. I didn't say that exactly that well, but leverage, they're kind of the flip of each other, where leverage is when you're trying to spend little bits of thing to have lots of impact, um, while uh, efficiency is when you kind of flip it, and instead of saying how much, thinking about how how much effort, instead of thinking about how much impact you want to have, you're instead thinking about how little effort you want to spend. I think that's the right way to think about it. In any case, um, this fifth one and final one here is Designing Your Life. Um, and Designing Your Life is a great book about like life planning uh, and using design thinking to kind of iterate through your life. Uh, so the key concepts for me here were instead of being um, stuck in kind of a job or a PhD program that you don't like, you can always do, you know, prototype things. So people think about prototypes a lot when they think about products are like okay let's not spend too much effort at this we don't really we want to validate some assumptions here um let's do it in a low cost way before we build out the whole thing you can do that with your life as well where you say hey i might want to live in nicaragua for the rest of my life but it's probably good for me to first like google it and see what it's like and then like call someone who lives there and then like spend a week there and then maybe live there or whatever um so Doing those prototypes are great, and there's a specific kind of prototype called a life interview, uh, where you essentially ask people who do things that you might want to do or the be are the way that you might might want to be, and you ask them what it's like. Uh, that's a great way to kind of prototype that experience without needing to do it. Um, the other key thing here is to use this uh, this mental model of reframes. So this book kind of reframes the question a lot. So for example, the reframe for the question what do you want to be when you grow up is actually who or what do you want to grow into? Um, and this allows you to say, it's not like a B state, um, but it's like it, the growth and the growing into life is all about growing and changing. It's not static. It's, it's, it's not about some destination. It's about the process. Um, and so, so being able to, when you feel like there's a, a problem and you're like, Oh man, you're, you're like, I can't solve this question. Probably try to reframe the question and then you'll be able to solve it. Um, cool. So at that, we are at the end of this interview. Woo! It, or not even an interview. Um, this is kind of like an interview with my past self as I, you know, read books and then I'm trying to regurgitate them for you. Um, I hope this was helpful. There's a lot of different frameworks in here. Um, I think the, 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 the meta point within all of this is that really to make sure that you are actively 
being able to put these different mental models on yourself as you go through life and do things. Um, and a lot of these were startup facing and team facing, and whatever. Um, and it's really helpful for those to be able to kind of, you know, put on these different versions for different situations is really, really helpful. Um, and all of them are about being more effective, kind of minimizing your risk, you know, maximizing your, your impact, minimizing your waste, that kind of stuff. Um, so hope that they are helpful. Uh, there's an awesome article, or I, there's an awesome, I wrote the article. There's an article online that, um, that, that dives into all of this in words, um, has a bunch of good links in it. You can see the books there and the, the my Goodreads list for all this stuff. Uh, and, and to note, this isn't a perfect list. If you have any awesome ones that you think should be added to this, that's great. Um, I just chose these 19 pseudo arbitrarily. I just think it was the best, um, you know, best cost benefit here. Um, 19 books instead of 100. Um, if you liked it, please uh, support me on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash R-H-Y-S-L-I-N-D m-a-r-k that's reese lindmark at patreon.com um and then also if you're into consulting stuff so i i do um i consult on these things um both on the organizational design design level the life coaching level um the kind of prioritization uh, of risk level so i do all of that um and i'm especially interested in coaching blockchain companies um so if you're one of those definitely reach out um the final note here is that this is i'm going to do another article like this another podcast like this but that looks into the kind of, uh, so this was in series B, human systems. So how we kind of like the frameworks and the systems that we use to operate with each other. There's, I have a series A, which is on, uh, which is on kind of macro systems. And that's like where we headed as a humanity, as humanity. And in that one, I'm going to have a similar um, deep dive like this, where we look at, you know, like 13 different books that kind of can help us conceptualize our future. Okay. So with that, thank you so much for your time. I need a glass of water. Um, Hope you're doing well and goodbye.